Welcome to the Everything Action Cast, the official podcast of EverythingAction.com. Hello and welcome to the Everything Action Cast, the podcast for the week of August 14th, 2023. I'm your host, Zach. I'm your co-host, Chris. And uh, we got some stuff diving this week, so let's jump right in. And uh, we'll kick things off with the only trailer we got, but it's a pretty big one. We got the first trailer for Scott Pilgrim Takes Off, which is the new Netflix anime uh, spin on Scott Pilgrim. Which is, it's it's sort of like an amalgamation of like all Scott Pilgrims, because it's Brian Lee O'Malley is executive producing and writing it. And the artwork is obviously based on his artwork for the comic. And then Edgar Wright's producing it, and the entire movie cast is back to voice their characters from the movie. And then from the video game side, like Anna Managuchi's coming to do the score for the show. So it's like it's like this all star, like all all corners of Scott Pilgrim universe coming together for this new uh, show. All they need now is one segment of like the video game sprite work, just a flash on the screen. Oh, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure there'll be some sort of reference. If if Anna Managuchi's doing the score, they're gonna have some sort of like reference or like a scene that's like a beat up or something probably I, I i would be shocked that there wasn't like the the f- logo flashes at the end like they flash like the street fighter logo and all these different logos that the scott player like name turns into so they know i hope but, yeah, ubisoft's gonna be like nope sorry like whatever bullshit copyright reason we did last time yeah but i mean it, it looks awesome it looks like i mean it's I mean, it's what you expect is comic. It's like the comic book art come to life, which I mean, they had there, there was a was there like a previous like motion comic or something? Very, it was like a prequel to the movie to kind of get you familiar. Yeah. It was just like Scott in the high school years to explain. Yeah. Um, him and uh, uh Kim's past relationship. Mm-hmm. And then that was it. It was like a it was like an Adult Swim sort of like pilot thing, or like, hey, yeah. what if this was like an idea? And then. Um, I guess they wanted to see how the movie was going to do before they pursued it. And the movie did not great. Well, even I though mean, it's like a cult classic now. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's beloved now. Yeah, like cult, it's, it, box office wise, it didn't do quite what they were expecting it to do, but. That's because, like, people weren't ready for it. Well, they had that, they had that, because they expected it to, like, be a huge hit based off Comic Con. Because, like, Comic Con, whatever year that came out, like, whatever year Sky Pilgrim came out, they're like, yeah, everyone, everyone come see Scott Pilgrim for free. And then they're like, oh, man, everyone loves it. It's, this is going to be huge. It's like, well, I loved it because they're Comic-Con fans who already love Scott Pilgrim. And it's a free movie. And it's a free movie. It's like, of course they loved it. Of course, yeah. Did they pay more? No. Did they got to see a movie that no one else did? No. Like, yes. You know, like, it's an exclusive. So you're going to love the idea that you're exclusive. But I get it. It's like... If they test that movie at a mall and they're like, wow, this movie did really well, that would be different. Like, you know, they used to do that back in the day of just like, secret screenings as a, like, a test audience kind of thing. Just grab people randomly at the mall and, like, do you want to yeah. see this movie? They can't stop <laughs> doing that. The Simpsons. Man, one, one kid loves the, <laughs> the, the bodybuilder guy. <laughs> like... Like they just scratch, oh, yeah. they just like the fear. Yeah, like, the, the, like, just uh, the crack button. the dial. The sp- no, what kid I, loves I the speedo like, man? Dial or was it just like a button yeah. that Nelson was holding down? You have to, yeah, you have to turn it left if you if you don't like something. You turn it right. Yeah. <laughs> the speedo man comes on like Nelson just turns Bill Hall's dial like co- like twenty times to the right. <laughs> you kids, you kids want to, you kids want a down to earth, realistic show that's completely off the wall and filled with magic robots. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, but I'm excited. As someone who, um, like, I, I read all the comics before the movie, or I think I read, like, up until a certain point, because the comic takes, like, a long detour in mm-hmm. one of the arcs. So it's not as fast-paced as the movie. The movie's a very, like, concise, let's just yeah, it's gonna, like, get right to it. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see the movie cast kind of have more room to breathe now because it's gonna be like you know it's, it's an eight episode tv show now not a, a movie so there's, uh, that, uh, definitely gonna expand upon stuff that they didn't get the chance to do in the movie probably <laughs> like the arc where they go on vacation maybe you didn't read the comic did you no not yet <laughs> yeah i might not spoil it for you but the vacation part is kind of long 
Like it's longer than you you want it to be. Mm-hmm. Oh, should probably mention too. Um, Science Saru is the studio that's doing the animation, so their biggest thing probably was Devil Man Crybaby previously. And they've done a bunch of other uh, you know anime stuff. Uh, they did uh, Inuo, they did Japan Sinks 2020. A, b- a bunch, a bunch of other, uh, either Japanese TV or Japanese online or some, uh, some web stuff. But, uh, yeah, they're they're doing the animation. There's a uh, one director f- from that studio is doing the, uh, every episode, and uh, Brian Lee O'Malley is is writing all the episodes uh, along with Ben David Grabinski, and then Edgar Wright's executive producing the whole show. And uh, November seventeenth is when uh, this kicks off. So definitely super excited for that. Definitely, I, I mean, I think. We both love the movie. We both love the game. So we're all <laughs> anything Scott Pilgrim we're uh, excited for. I'm wondering uh, what ending they're gonna go for. Oh, yeah. Because the movie Are ending team is team knives or team. Uh, yeah, because the, cause the well, the movie had both. Like you, you, you can watch like they, they, they think they filmed both both for the they both both endings for the movie. And then like the one was like the lead scene uh, if you wanted to watch unlike the Blu-ray and stuff, but. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I think the, I think the comic book the, the comic ending is different than the movie ending, right? No, no, they still end up together. Oh, okay. It just makes more sense later on that mm-hmm. like it's more him and knives because Scott kind of has like fascinations, but him and Roman Roman just makes more sense. Like I don't know, mm-hmm. uh, just their how they he fought to like win her, but then yeah, yeah. that's not the message. It's like you shouldn't fight to win someone. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It, it's it's weird. It, it's like I get it, especially that time when you read it when you're like a, a, a confused, like young love, like I don't know, twenty year old. It rings a lot because in okay, so Zach and I, for those who don't know, like we went to this nerdy college, and when that book came out, my fucking senior year, of, like college, when there was like the movies hyping up, there were so many like super weird nerds thinking they're Scott Pilgrim. Like, everyone was like, oh my god, I'm like a Scott Pilgrim. Like, that's not what you should be wanting. Don't be a Scott <laughs> Pilgrim. Yeah. It's it's just like when they're like the Jim and Pam thing. They're like, I'm such a Jim and Pam. Like, you know, like this. I'm like, no, it's not a healthy relationship. You people are insane. Mm-hmm. So yeah, like, I, 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 that, I hope that doesn't come back where people are like, oh, like, I'm such a this, I'm such a that. It's like, these are problems. You know, it's like, how many people have you counted at, like, a Comic-Con, Zach, where it's, like, so many Ramona flowers? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's died down. You still, you still see one or two in the wild, but I think for, like, 20, 2012, 20, 2012-2014, a lot of Ramona flowers. It was, like, the Harley Quinn before that <laughs> yeah. like, mm-hmm. kind of took over again. Mm-hmm. So it did give us a break from Harley Quinn's, but that's not any better. Well, it's it's all it's all Barbie this year. Oh, I the Which, amount of of but I, did you see that meme of the like bimbo can, chems the himbo ones? Yeah, where it's like you're gonna see this douche at like a like Halloween party this year. Like like Ryan Gosling in his his like evil cat like fur coat th- like yep. <laughs> outfit. Yeah, I don't know the reference yet. I'm probably gonna figure out when it streams in September. Because I think Barbie's coming to Max, I think it's a dumb. Yeah, 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 we'll have Max sometime, hopefully soon. Uh, yeah, right next and then I can get the joke, but I mean, I, I still want to see it. I just had no time to see it in theaters. Um, but, but yeah, I was bringing it up because uh, we found out this week that Barbie is now the highest grossing film of all time for Warner Bros. domestically. It has made $537.5 million domestically, uh, topping Dark Knight, which made $536 million. And it also is going to probably become well, it's def, it's definitely the hi, the highest grossing uh, film domestically of the year. It tops it tops Super Mario Brothers. Um, and now and then it, it probably will if it keeps up its momentum. It probably is going to top Super Mario Brothers worldwide too. Uh, Barbie has 1.2 billion dollars worldwide, and Mario has 1.335 billion dollars worldwide. But I mean. The moment that Barbie has still, like, it could still, you know, top <laughs> Super Mario. Become, I think it's tracking ahead of Super Mario as well. So we're, 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 there's a very high likelihood that Barbie's going to be the biggest movie 
domestically and worldwide for 2023. Not even, and it won't be close. You know, I'm wondering because a lot of some countries are like banning Barbie, so I wonder if that's gonna yeah. affect the overall like worldwide sales. I I, th- I think it, I think it opened in most of the markets that are would count. Like okay. some, some some markets some of the markets is banned in like don't really. I mean, they're not they're not a huge factor. I'm like it could have been a couple maybe million dollars, but it's not really gonna you know. I, I think it's <laughs> it causing like, train wreck. Russia, like, it's banned in like the middle east because it's like oh how they are like a woman-led comedy it's like that, yeah. that was like already a problematic thing for them which you know screw them i think china's okay i'm not sure Barbie's i don't think, in china i don't know if it's got a chinese release yet um i mean i think maybe it did china china's really buckled down on the like hollywood releases they really are focused on in the last couple of years of like their own movies no yeah yeah so china did love uh barbie and then uh it's surprising like taught them about feminism because <laughs> mm-hmm. apparently a lot of feminist movies don't do well in china and then it's like this kind of snuck under the radar and then they're just like oh shit like barbie back back, back two is also doing very well in china because that was like a chinese co-production yeah, yeah that was a jo- china joint because i'm like jason statham couldn't even get underwater well at least the help of china Th- that's my understanding of like the first meg too because it's like mm-hmm. he didn't he couldn't even have the boat unless china was involved and yes. now it's like now he's got a water station that had China ridden everywhere on that thing. And they, and they got Wolf Warrior, that Wu Jing in there, co- coach sorry with uh, Jason Statham in Meg yeah, Two. So that became a uh, a triple threat movie. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, technically, was Triple Threat a China movie or is that just? I think that was like a like international, right? Yeah. Because Wolf Warrior was blatantly like Chinese propaganda. Oh yeah, especially the first. The first one was like so blatant. Like we we just stop. We just show these infidel, like these intruders, like what the power, the might of China is. Like yeah, and it was all it was all it was, that. it was all like a Chinese training exercise. And then like like it was it was uh was it Frank Grillo in the first one? It, it was the first one. Oh no, I think I think it was oh, Frank Grillo in the first one. No, I think I think the first one was uh. It's Frank Grill, and then um, I, I forget who the was the first one. Oh yes, Scott Atkins was in the first one. Yeah, so Scott so Scott Atkins was the villain of the first one, and then Frank Grill was the villain of the second one. And they were both they were both like evil like international mercenaries that like invade China or invade like. Uh, the second one was like in in like Africa, but it's some it's, it's some country that China has like a like a good relationship with, or they're trying to like control or something. So it's like we 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 have to stop them from uh like uh you know, interfering with our our relationship with uh, this African country. Which I think I think I think it was a weird uh. What was what was that uh, cell phone movie we watched, Chris? <laughs> the Mike Tyson movie. Holy oh, shit! Like the cellular one. Yeah, I think I think it might be the same country that it was in that movie. Like that was a African colony, some North African place. Was it China salesman? Yes. That was, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I forgot that movie. I. Where we gotta watch that movie again before whatever <laughs> records of that is just burnt. But I, uh, geez, I, I forgot about China Salesman. <laughs> but uh, now, but now it flooded right back, and mm-hmm. that was another propaganda movie. Holy Man, that, crap, was that a propaganda that, movie? Well, the whole middle was just China. Like our cell phone service is the best service. We'll prove it. We're gonna prove it with our demonstration, and we're gonna. We're gonna take. We're gonna get the contract for all the self service in this African country. So, and then, and then they hired Mike. Some some other rival like was it France? Did France hire Mike Tyson to sabotage China? No, no. He he was already a rebel group that got yeah. hired by the rival companies, but then he wanted to do his own thing. Mm-hmm. So he was paid. He was a paid domestic terrorist. Yep. But he still wanted to just liberate his region from. Yeah, because yeah, there's, 
there's a civil war going on in that country, and then Steven Seagal was there running a bar for whatever reason. He ran the cantina from Star yeah. Wars, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, let's not get into China Salesman again. Let's oh, save yeah. that for another time. I was just going to run down, since we're, it's it's almost the end of the summer, uh, there's like two weekends left, and I don't think anything's really going to change. I was just going to run down like the top ten movie, some movies of the summer uh, for this year. So it's Barbie's number one, obviously. Uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is number two. That was like way bigger than I think a lot of people expected it to be. Especially like, created the first one. The first one did well, but I think a lot of people were like didn't think the, this one was going to be as huge as it was, and it was pretty huge. And then uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 was number three. Uh, Little Mermaid was number four. Oppenheimer was number five, which that's the only one that could maybe switch. Like Oppenheimer could like make some a bit more money and like pass Little Mermaid. Uh, Sound of Freedom, the surprise surprise hit of the summer, is at number six. Is that the Maestro one? That's that's the Jim Caviezel child traffic like child oh, trafficking okay. like like we got we got save these kids from ch- child traffickers. Gotcha. Forgot that's the name of the movie. Yeah. Uh, Indiana Jones and Dial Destiny is number seven. Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning is number eight. Uh, Transformers: Rise of the Beast is number nine, and Elemental is number ten. I can't believe Elemental somehow climbed somewhere back in the ranking. Well, I mean, yeah, it came out, it came out the same weekend as Flash, and they both seemed like they're gonna be like gigantic disasters. But then Elemental, Elemental just hung in there, and like, like the the drops from week to week were like way way less than the Flash, obviously. So, yeah, Elemental Elemental is not going to be a, it's not going to break even or like maybe like it's going to struggle to be profitable, but it's not, it's not as big as disasters that seems like it was going to be. The flash is a total complete trade wreck. Like it's going to lose. It's, War Bros is going to lose probably like over $200 million in that movie. I can't believe that. And that flash is number 12, by the way, it's behind fast X. And it only made, the flash only made $108 million. <laughs> And it costs like three hundred, some three hundred, four hundred million something. <laughs> that was that was the kind of, that was the trend of summer too. Was like a lot of these movies like cost so much goddamn money, and they and then even though they made like like you know Indiana Jones made like one hundred seventy three million dollars, it's it's not it's nowhere even close to breaking even. The payoff, like, yeah, yeah. The, it costs like four. It, it costs debt. like it costs like four hundred million dollars to make. <laughs> Uh, that, and if that's, I mean, on that, paper, I, I still think the Flash would have worked. I just don't know if it was the CGI, the plot. Yeah. Just where did it go wrong? And since you saw the movie, you said it was. It what, what was it to you? What, what do you think it was? Uh, I think I, I mean I think it was. I I I I thought it was fine. I think the big thing was yeah, like just the end it becomes this like. You know, fan servicey mush of like, here, we're just gonna throw stuff, like throw like things you know at you, and like that, that looks, and you you should be like we expect you to cheer at them. Like here's here's this person in a bubble flying past you. <laughs> like, isn't that cool? Isn't like the multiverse, right? Everyone loves the multiverse. Wait, what the fuck bubble? There's. There's uh toward the end there's like bubbles of uh, like other multiverses that are flying or start flying in because of like you know it gets it builds to this point where like it's like there are like the multiverse is like collapsing because of what the Flash is doing <laughs> and then you see like glimpses of like other DC worlds and other DC universes coming in so he's legit a bubble that travels through the time. Oh yeah, the, well, the, you 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 haven't seen like the, like the time bubble that he he runs in. Nope. Like the t- so the, they the way they sh- depict like the speed force is that the Flash is running in this void and then he's like in kind of a lightning bubble and then like the like the events of history are like play out like around him and then kind of like looks like almost looks like a like a like a concert like, arena or something or like a like a stadium or a coliseum. So like the Flash will be running in the past and you'll see like these like horrific CG. Like you'll see the events of like Justice League going like rewinding backwards, but it's like all CG and then it's like a, like all, all, it, it kind of like refracted like a hundred times back, going back like it's like a hundred Henry Cavill's just like going backwards into like this like stadium seating kind of like thing. 
which it's it's okay. like okay it's that's an interesting idea but then the execution is horrific <laughs> yeah i on paper or comic form that sounds cool i don't know because i know i from what i've seen and heard they cut a lot of money on the graphic budget so well apparently it's, it's supposed not... to it's supposed to look that way because like reality is distorted to Barry when he's in the Speed Force, so that's the official explanation. Excuse? Yep. Because it looks like they went behind on the whole uh, it looks, graphics department. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it looks it looks like PS3 graphics when like he's in the Speed Force of like, oh, this is like the the PS3 Justice League game. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, like it's just like this is what that would look like if you if you had like PS3 era like Henry Cavill like. <laughs> rendered I think I think it's going to be on uh Max in like a couple like two, two or three weeks Chris so you can have, you can finally check it out and see see it for yourself mm. I think they said like September 5th I think maybe is when that's going to come out on Max so two weeks two or three weeks from now But I mean, it seems like it seems like Barbie's gonna like balance out any sort of like disaster the Flash was, because like you know Barbie is like phenom like cultural phenomenon that'll like <laughs> cancel out the disaster of the Flash. And then Barbie's gonna pay all the debts. Mm -hmm. So uh, other news, uh, actually breaking a little bit before we started recording. Uh, uh, the podcast uh, a couple hours ago is uh, the first look at Monarch Legacy of Monsters, which is formerly called Godzilla and the Titans, which sounded like a like a weird sitcom that it was going to be like a Godzilla sitcom. But uh, that Monarch Monarch Legacy of Monsters is a much more like serious title. And this this is the MonsterVerse Apple TV Plus show featuring Godzilla, featuring other monsters. It's going to be set post. Godzilla, the 2014 movie, and then by, and I think sometimes it's set, it's set between Godzilla and and then Godzilla King of the Monsters, and it's gonna star a bunch of people, including the Russell boys. Kurt and Wyatt are in this show. Kurt Russell is is the present day character, and then there's gonna be flashbacks to the 50s where uh, Wyatt Russell is gonna be playing the same character as his dad, but like younger version. And he he has some sort of ties to Monarch, some sort of like what they were doing in the 50s that we're going to flash back to. And then there's like other characters in the present day who are trying to like – they learned that their family has like ties to Monarch. So they're trying to figure out what their family's ties are and also like you know survive this new world of monsters. So this is before the last Godzilla is, vs. King Kong? This is this is after the first, the first movie in the MonsterVerse, Godzilla 2014. But he before out Brian Cranston already. Yeah, so yeah, he, he he destroyed San Francisco, fighting like the uh, the Mutos, and then it's 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 before Godzilla King of the Monsters, so before like you know Ghidorah and all the other monsters got unleashed. Why not? I mean, just be where he is now. I don't know why it's like it has to be between that timeline. Yeah, I, I'm not. I don't know. Maybe maybe too much. It'd be too much to have like all these other all the other monsters or you know robot monsters now and King Kong showing up and. Well, no. See, this is the first time King Kong seen Godzilla was when it was yeah. time to throw down because King Kong discovered a temple in the center of the Earth mm -hmm. of Hollow Earth theory because that's a thing. You know what I mean? Like that that exists now in that universe. So well, I think I think I think, I think that. That's all going to be in the new movie, Godzilla X Kong, the new empire that's coming up uh, in like a year or two. They're going to get to yeah. all, I th they're getting to all that stuff in that movie. So this is going to be, this is, yeah, this is more like. Uh, back to basics. Back to basics. And then also like more kind of like Skull Island where like, we're kind of like going back to like the origins of Monarch and like the pat like Mon what Monarch was doing in, you know, I, I think if it was the fifties. I think it's, that'd be pre Skull Island too. So like, we're gonna like we're gonna be between Godzilla and King of the Monsters, but also like going back before Skull Island. But I mean, the, the screenshots was good. I mean, I, I'm I'm very I'm pleased that I'm 
Godzilla's definitely there in one of, the, one of those screenshots. So I'm I'm happy with that. Hopefully he's in it quite a bit and not just like, hey, I have a cameo in the first episode and then no more Godzilla. Or you or you like hear him. It's like, oh, Godzilla's over there. Look, you can't see him, but he's over there. Like, oh, it's gonna be just like I'm thinking, uh, like Teen Titans, where Batman never shows up until the second season. Yeah. And well, I then... hope. I mean, Apple TV, Apple, TV, Apple seems like they spend a ton of money on their shows, so hopefully they're gonna like you know spend the money that this needs to have lots of Godzilla, lots of other monsters in it. Oh, but I guess this, I could see Godzilla. I mean, I could see Apple getting cheap and going, "Ha ha, we tricked you." I yeah all all their shows all the shows I've seen of them have been seems like they've been super high quality and super high budget so I don't I don't think they would cheap out on a Godzilla show <laughs> like, Godzilla would not be the show they would cheap out on I mean like you know like you know Foundation looks amazing and um even you know even like the comedy shows have like really like really good production values and like you know Mystic Quest has like crazy sets and all sorts of stuff going on with. And I don't think there's no release date yet. Um, so, I mean, the, the green light last in uh, January last year. So, so hopefully, maybe next year. Maybe, maybe if the maybe they'll like do like both the the show and the new movie like the same year or something. They have like a you know monsterverse <laughs> mania going on. And then uh, speaking of shows and release dates, uh, we've got two other release dates for some up- upcoming shows. Uh, Fargo Season 5 is coming up, and uh, we got the release date for that. Uh, it's Jan- November 21st on FX slash Hulu, which uh, is going to star John Hamm and uh, Juno Temple, Jennifer J- Jason Lee, a bunch of other people. Uh, Joe, Joe, uh, Joe Curie from... Uh, Stranger Things, so. And I, I think, was gonna say this is a lost arc of Mad Men, where it's a it becomes a Fargo. This is what happened. This is what happened post Mad Men. He yeah, like moved he, to, he goes out to the of Midwest, the yeah. And then he's like, yeah, I'm gonna start simple with a lie. And then now he's just in the mob. Is that the current running thing about Fargo? It's always a, uh, like a mob thing. Well, I think so. I think the setup is there's some sort of so Joe Temple's playing a uh, like typical typical seeming housewife, but then she has like she gets into trouble with the law, and then John Hamm is like the local like North Dakota sheriff who's like trying to find her, and then just other other characters are you know popping in and out, and I'm sure it's gonna spiral into like complex craziness by the end of the season, as all Fargo things do. Like John Hamm's a sheriff. John Hamm is like a North Dakota like sheriff who's like trying to like he like kind of gets it's like oh this housewife is like in trouble I gotta track her down she's like in, she's in trouble or she's like doing some uh, bad stuff so I gotta find her. I thought isn't there another movie or show where John Hamm is a sheriff but it's like two ladies with the same name? That was a movie that was like last year I think it was like uh something. Yeah, I think I think Tina Fey directed that movie, maybe. Okay, so I didn't go crazy because I'm like, this yeah. sounds familiar. It was yeah, it was I can't remember what the title was, but the title was like so, a woman's name, and then there was like parentheses S because it was two of them. And yeah, I think I think I think that was a, like I think that was like a Tina Fey directed movie. And he was also obviously in like you know Confess Fletch, which I still haven't seen, but I've heard I've heard very mixed thing about. Confess Fletch. Like some people are like, oh, it's awesome, and some people are like, oh, it's terrible. So I don't know. Yeah, I heard that too. I heard like it, it. If this is your first, this shouldn't be your first Fletch movie. But then it's also this doesn't feel like a Fletch movie. Well, I've heard it's closer to the books because the books aren't as like wacky as the, the Chevy Chase movies. So if you're like a book purist, this is better. This is like the best Fletch movie because it's more of like that I... tone. I have never met someone who's a Fletch <laughs> book purist. Yeah. Or someone that read the book. Oh, your uh, your movie was uh, Maggie Moore's. Maggie Moore's, okay. 
Oh, John, 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 Sl- John, John Slattery directed it, and then Tina Fey co-starred with John Hamm in it, so. And then uh, we also got a release date for Chucky Season 3, which is going to be on Sci-Fi and USA. And then I believe, I, th- I think I think they've all the seasons have ended up on Shutter at some point, but the, the season three is going to end up on uh, start on October fourth. And you know you know pick pick up the uh, pick up the story the storyline from the past two seasons of uh, the Chucky Show. I think what Chucky wants to be president. Well, he's like he's like uh, he had some sort of plot to um like he he was going to invade like children's hospitals or something in the first season or second season and then that got foiled. So now he's like he's after, he's, in, he's off for revenge against everyone who stopped him last season. Gotcha. And then he and then he and Tiffany are like enemies now. So like Tiffany is on the side of good starting to stop Chucky. And yeah, so oh, it's also so it's gonna be streaming on Peacock the next day too. So it's like it's Sci-Fi USA, Peacock, and then also probably eventually Shutter. It's like it's, it's, Chucky is such a crazy, like everyone everyone has the rights to Chucky apparently. <laughs> well, is it Peacock, Sci-Fi, and someone else? They all like team up. They're, they're, they're all well, they're all universal. They're all NBC Universal. It's all ah, of those. Okay. So I mean that makes sense. And then they must have, then they must have made signed a deal with like AMC slash Shutter to have this because I know I know definitely season one of is uh, has been on Shutter for like a, for forever. But yeah, just you know, just never Halloween you can check out uh, season three of Chucky. And uh, that's it for news news. We jump into show and tell. And uh, Chris, what do you watch over the last week or so here? Oh, okay. So I've been catching up on some old movies and one new release. Uh, I'll start with um, one of the older ones. Um, it's about the movie Jolt, what, uh, starring Kate, uh, the uh, Kate Beckinsale crank knockoff. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a pr- pr- Amazon Prime ex- exclusive. Yeah. And, you know, it was on my, like, watch, like, to watch list. I've been seeing, I saw like the ads for it and then it went away. So I kind of forgot it was a thing. And then I was like, you know what? Screw it. Watched Mm it. And I didn't really prepare myself for it. Like, I think I was thinking it was going to be closer to crank, but this is more of like a, uh, I'm trying to think of like, it feels like an early 2000s, like direct to DVD movie, like something you see in the shelf or like, you know, on a rental a red box. Like a red box rent. Like it feels so in that error because of just how the the dialogue's written and the characters are portrayed and 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 like the the stereotypes they throw at you. It mm-hmm. there's like nuggets of okay parts and like some fun dialogue that just sort of doesn't belong in this movie because it's it's like such a funny comedic punch up like this wouldn't happen in real life situation and just the dialogue, not even the action. Cause that we'll get to that part, but just the like repertoire between Kate Beckinsale and, uh, uh, was it Bobby? Cannavale. Cannavale. Yeah. Yeah. It's because like she has this proper English accent and he's supposed to be this beat detective and he has a crush on her and she's trying to be proper. But the thing is, she's got an expl- like the gimmick of the movie is that she has an explosive attitude that is just um, based. It's based on a actual true disorder called intermediate explosive disorder, which I think in the movie they just like triggered it to be like even crazy. And so instead of her outrage of triggering and doing whatever, it's her having homicidal thoughts. And and it, it's like, 
the thing that calms her down is violence or shocks electricity. But the movie focuses on more on the concept of she jolts herself. Like she electric she has this like full body taser set up, like almost like electro on her body. Like she has all these like plugs she slaps on. And then she wears a full body uh electric suit, which in the right way they could have wired it. It could have been sort of erotic, but it looks more industrial. Like it looks something that I also feel like this is this would generate a lot of heat when she jolts herself. And I'm, I'm not sure why she's not sweating, because the concept is that she's jolting herself constantly throughout the day because of all these minor annoyances she finds in people. So the movie's pretty funny at, at showing you how shitty the people around her are, like some of the like random citizens. She gets annoyed and occasionally she takes it out on them, like she'll slam a car door in someone's leg. She'll punch someone, she'll, she'll slap someone, you know, that is like, hey, you're annoying me, or some sort of gross um, attitude or disrespectful thing. She will, she's sort of justified because you root for her, except for one early sequence where he's on a date, and the major dean is insulting uh, Jai Courtney, and then she bashes this woman's head in the bathroom stall, like, a very uncomfortable amount of bashes that you know leaves you like stunned that she's got this outrage but then there's there's no sympathy moment where she doesn't do anything positive yet so the movie the first 10 minutes is that you know and maybe a little bit the backstory of why she's like this what led to her condition how she's been trying to control it um she doesn't really come from a true military background which is surprising because the movie shows you that you because you okay like what do you think she does for a living zach what do you think this person with like all these skills or not even skills just something well based on the trailer i thought she was like you know like you know a hitman or an assassin or something nope nope completely not okay it, it's shown that she she had a rough upbringing because her parents were um a little fast and loose with the parenting. I don't want to give away that. It doesn't actually play anything, but it's just like they were just typical parents, but they had drug issues, but they don't look like they were druggies. They look very healthy in the movie. You're like, what? Like, these people? And then she went into the military at a young age, and this is played by different women. So, like, it's her growing up. So mm-hmm. assume it's supposed to be assuming she did all this, so she did the military... She got kicked out at a young, I think she she just passed maybe basic training or not even. We have no idea. The movie goes so fast in this part. The basic training then jumps to her now where she just lives alone in this generic city. And, you know, she, she, it's, I think she does mention that she's an ex bouncer. She recently was let go from her job for just assaulting a Patreon, like a patron in the bar. So she has all these like, odd skill sets well they you know, they like do a quick montage during this thing where she shoots a gun and she's good at like hand-to-hand combat through like a school like she joined like a tiger showman's thing but she beat the shit out of her sparring partner so it doesn't quite make you a good killer and she doesn't come from anything that makes her good at particularly um these skills but she sort of mentions yeah i picked some things here and there like it's a very fast and loose interpretation of what that means right it's just oh i'm just good at things because i've done a lot of things not to this degree you Mm -hmm. i mean that's where i'm like you have to suspend disbelief but i do give the credit the movie does move at a like a very fast pace as soon as you sense a slowdown they immediately jump to the next thing like there'll be parts where like one detective is just reading a newspaper and then about something else after another scene and it won't have a transition, Kate Beckinsale will just be there. And you're like, I thought, like, you think she's across town or it's like the next, or like, you know, something else. And the movie's just like, nope. Like, here she is. Like, whoa, whoa, how, what? Like, it's it's very like, oh, we we're only going to give you very sl- small glimmers. But, okay. This is where the movie kind of falls apart by the second to third act is that they sort of reveal who the big bad is and the big bad who's um 
sort of like responsible for killing Jai Courtney. And it's one of those like, not just spoil it, because you could tell like what it is just by mentioning it. He dies off screen and they don't have a body like for a while. And then when they do have the body, it's one of those, I don't think I, they focus in on it. It's like, no, we have a body. And it's just like this. It's You know what I mean? It's just like that lump. And then then it's Kate Beckinsale swearing vengeance and following the trail, which leads to, uh, what's his name? David Bradley, a.k.a. Walter Frey, mm-hmm. who has... Honestly, the most bizarre introduction to his character and to like his he like to show you how of an evil criminal empire he owns. So the let me give you the setup. There is this sweeping shot of like an office room, this huge vaulted office room of like it's very nice and modern. And then he's just hanging there on hooks. And then he gets lowered like a puppet, like down. And then he's like, all right, well, like, that's just, like, my hanging session for the night. Anyway, like, what's, how's my criminal empire going? Like, tell me, like, all right, henchmen, like, tell me what's going on. (laughs) And none of that ever gets brought up. None of that is ever mentioned again. It's just something to show that he's kooky. You know, it's like, oh, Mm -hmm. maybe it's going to be a MacGuffin. Maybe he's going to get hung by it. Maybe Kate Beckinsale is going to use the winching or wires or something to kind of play up for it. You can't just introduce like this masochist thing and not like do anything with it, but that's what they do. They, he, he could be played by anyone. David Bradley is kind of wasted in this. I mean, he gives a, he gives like a really weird speech about cockroaches and lobsters, how cockroaches and lobsters are essentially the same species, like, uh, you know, the same creature, but one is this and one is that. I, it goes nowhere, Zach. It's mm-hmm. so bizarre. It, it's like, okay, I, is it, does he have the same issue? Does he like the, the same thing? Is, does he have the explosive problem thing? And his way of handling it is, is masochism, you know, like, cause it is masochism. Kate Beckinsale's thing is that she uses the pain to distract herself, but mm-hmm. like, uh, I mean, I guess I'll spoil it so much because you just can't avoid it. She just stops. Like, <laughs> like it's one of those things where it's imagine ahead of time, like you're going to get used to the pain and you're going to look for the next thing to kind of get you to do this. And, you know, we don't know what that's going to happen. And so she just gets so angry, she goes numb. And then, like, the jolt thing the whole gimmick of it just stops being part of it. Which is weird. Because it's not like she needs it to supercharge herself to kind of give her a fighting chance. It's the opposite. She does it so she doesn't go crazy. And the movie only uses that like in one scene, and that's before the finale, or sort of leading up to the final battle. And then... It's a lot of wasted potential, in my opinion, for that. Like, it, it's a fun world. It's a fun characters. They're fast and loose with a lot of um, the movie magic because uh, she just she does a good amount of destruction and all these like issues. And there seems to be no one um, caring. They kind of mentioned that early where. Yeah, like, it's even ridiculous. Like, they really tell you early in the movie where it's like when Jai Courtney's dead, even the cops are like, we'll never know who did this. Like, <laughs> they're pretty honest about it. It's like, oh, but she's like, oh, I'm going to go find out. It's like, well, like, that's illegal for you to try to do it this way. It's like, is it illegal? She's just going to ask questions. It's like, well, you were the last person to see, like, Jai Courtney alive, so don't step out of line. And the moment she does step out of line, it's like, now we have to arrest you. It's like, on what evidence? I mean, yeah, there's one, the, the, she does a breaking entering and the cops are just there. But in terms of like everything else, the cops just seem more focused on getting her than actually putting away Jack Courtney's murder. And that's why it's like, oh, is it that like, maybe they're in on it? Maybe there's like a bigger conspiracy? And you know what it is, Zach? 
like none of that. <laughs> Left field shows up. I mean, I'm gonna spoil a little bit. Jai Courtney's just there again, mm-hmm. and and then 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 it's just over. Like again, I want you to see it to get what I mean, but it's just over and it like. Okay, I feel like this would have been more spectacular if I cared about his character, if I learned anything. He's in it for, like, four scenes or less. Mm -hmm. And then it's just over, right? (laughs) But then I'm like, there's still, like, ten minutes of the movie left. Okay, not to spoil it, because you'll see it by the poster. Susan Sarandon just shows up at the end as, like, a Nick Fury kind of character. I got a recruit you for... The the jolt the jolt of jolt of vergers. <laughs> I, I'm not even kidding. That is something that kind of kind of happens. Like Susan Sarandon's like, I've been watching you. Like you're someone that's gonna get like I think you're bringing up a good a recruit. Blah blah blah. And and, and then there's a flashback. I, I there is a weird weird ass flashback where it's like, oh, as a kid, like Susan Sarandon was there. Like what? And then the movie just ends. They had, they had joined all the other uh, like prime like, prime video originals. Like I, I I honestly I don't think she's a good recruit because like why? Even though she's like oh you're such a good weapon, the easiest like you know did you know like the best weapon is like a human weapon? It's like she says something to that along the lines, and it's not even that clever because like uh. Kate Beckinsale gets captured a lot. Like she mm-hmm. gets detained, she gets she gets wounded as regular people. Uh, like she's still vulnerable to things just because she can't. Um, like she has to tase herself, and she she can still feel other pain. She just gets numb to like the tasing of herself. So that's where I'm like, you just can't introduce that as a concept where it's like, oh, it's the MacGuffin where she jolts herself, but then what happens if you jolt yourself too much and you get used to it? Well, you need to go to the next level, like, you know, or you need to come down from it so that you can reset yourself. Like, you know, it's kind of any, I get any kind of overuse of anything, like too much isn't good, but then it's like, if you just wait and just reset, you know, you lower it, you kind of reset your brain. I don't I'm not, I'm not like a, a, therapists about this or like uh like a drug addiction counselor but it totally makes sense in the movie because uh you know who does say this her fucking psychiatrist played by stanley tucci mm-hmm. and stanley tucci he wears the same clothes the whole movie and it's been days you only see him in one room of the whole movie he never leaves this one setting he's it, it's it's citadel he's working for this <laughs> they're trying to keep, keep back itself for citadel I, hey you know, if for some odd, bizarre reason this is a Citadel tie-in, I wouldn't be. I would be like, "Oh, this makes sense then," because, like, it it's so weird because it's okay. Like, not just I guess I'll go a little bit more. It's a CIA thing, like all around. It, mm-hmm. but it makes no sense. Like, this is so dumb of a. It's supposed to be like a black, like black site project, and it's not. Then it is, and double twists. Like it, it sort of is again. Like I, you just don't care at that point. Like that's why when Susan Sarandon shows up, I was like kind of mad. I was like, "What? Like what are you doing here?" And then, uh, yeah, like this is it's a fun movie to watch, I guess, if you're into like just random action and and silly comedy because there's like slapstick moments in here that kind of feel out of place, but. It's uh, it's definitely something that you should just see on like Amazon. I don't think it's worth renting. I don't think it's worth. If this came to theaters, I would be surprised if. Uh, I don't. I don't think. I think. I think it was only. It was only like a Prime Video. You can only stream it. Like I don't think you could ever like. I mean, I'm sure they sell like. I'm sure they sell like some sort of copy of all their movies. But yeah, this was like a. Come to Prime Video. We got this. We got this new movie. You can only see it here. This this in Samaritan. Yeah, I, I don't, I, you could definitely feel like the caliber. Sometimes they get lucky with good Amazon-only movies, but this felt kind of held back. I want, I just wish it wasn't PG-13, because it's a lot of, like, people going to sleep. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. all her attacks just make them, like, get knocked out by, like, one punch. Or, like, they, they're gently, like, 
bonked on the head. You know, like it's not. <laughs> yeah. Anything. Even people with guns, and you think this movie would have more guns, but I think. I think the cops shoot more like at people at her than at like the villains at anyone else. Like it's very, you know, action evil action safe. Meanwhile, she's doing fun things. Like she'll she's doing a lot of running and and I guess parkour. It's not really parkour. It's just fast. And then her fighting is frantic. That's because she has some good training and then some sort of like anger, you know, she just taps into her anger so it makes her go like fights like a mental patient. But it's a it's definitely a good like just toss on and just review for the year. I again I get why the it, the, the the critics are definitely like either you liked it or you didn't. Or it's like it becomes so white noise through anything else you've seen. And I just wish they utilized the whole gimmick of her kind of revving up herself, like using it as a way to kind of power her up or a way to kind of let her do some superhuman stuff. Also, there's one point where she builds a bomb. No explanation mm-hmm. how she does that. Just she MacGyver something and it's so and then uh, again, you have to watch this because I don't want to spoil it. But she does something that out of nowhere it does not like it does not play. It's more of a visual thing because I guess the Amazon was like, we need to burn the budget, so let's just do like a, a random explosion scene. And it makes no sense. But yeah, definitely go see it, Zach. So I can talk been, about it more. Yeah, it, yeah, it's been on my list, so <laughs> like I kind of rank uh in terms of like action. I don't know. I, I kind of like uh, uh, like Crank is definitely going to be better, you know? Like Crank, mm-hmm. hands down, unbeaten champ of gimmick uh, person with a like condition movie. I'm, I'm trying to think of the category. Like, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know how you describe it, but like Crank's definitely... It, it kind of... Her having to like have shocks to like calm herself or like to like stop like this disorder also sounds like have you ever read or have you heard of like the, the Terminal Man the Michael Crichton like book slash movie? No, what's that one? So the Terminal Man it, it was like one of the first it was like one of the earlier Michael Crichton books but like it was this guy who had he'd black out and then have like violent episodes and he had some sort of like epilepsy slash like some other disorder and then they put like electrodes in his brain to like control them and then he has like a it's supposed to like release at a certain like interval but he they, he like figures out a way to like hack it and then he can like get like shocks whenever he wants and it, like becomes like this like pleasure thing for him and he's he becomes like this crazy he's like goes nuts and he's like i'm shocking myself all the time and i'm i'm crazy now like it was sort of like a frank it was like my crane's like taking like a frankenstein story but like this guy who had like a you know all these electrodes in his brain <laughs> which is like it was supposed to be like cutting edge science at the time as all Michael Crichton stuff is was he like the guy depressed because of like I think, uh I, I think it was an accident so then he, the accident caused this disorder in his brain and then there, there's doctors who were like let's try this experimental uh electroshock like implants and see if that helps him and does it just make him go mad? Pretty, pretty much, yeah. Because he figures out like, oh, I, I can just get shocks whenever I want, and then I can like do get, like I can because each any, each electro is in a different part of his brain, so he can get he can get like different like stimulus to whatever he wants to like in his brain. I see. So, um, so he, you know, he can get like he can get like sexy shocks or like. Oh, sweet, then he gets addicted. Like, anger to shock. Shocking. Yeah, he gets it. Yeah. Okay, like that's a different. That's definitely like a character study of someone self manipulating everything their brain is doing. A little different. Uh, <laughs> again, this movie has better potential because it's not like she shocks herself because, like, she stops it because she can, like, gives into her impulse. There's no, um, like, some impulses don't have any reason. She's like, I need a kill, and. It's not like, okay, well, now you can kill because these people are trying to kill you. And then she does, like, 
very soft karate against people. I mean, it's not super soft. I don't want to be punched by the her, but in terms of like the the like frenzy thoughts she has in her head, and then it's like that homicidal rage, and you get a little glimmers. There's like one or two funny like sequences with it where you see her have these like, okay, try not to do this, like don't don't murder my lover, you know. Cool. That's you like thinking this. I mean, terrible that it happens, but now you're fighting against people. And the problem is she never fights anyone really that's on the same like level as her. So it's like always this like she's a tornado of punches against people who don't want to be punched. Or if they are, they're just doing their job. So that's why I, you know, like there's some lost potential, at least in Crank. It didn't need a movie where there was another guy with a heart condition. But he fought against a crazy, like, mob setup. They introduced the mob setup in, in Joel. They just don't give you a good reason. And then even they are sort of confused of why she's there. They don't really give her a reason either. It's like, oh, you killed Jai Courtney. And, and then, like, David Bradley's like, I guess I did. <laughs> you know, like, that's it. That's as much plot we get for that line. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I guess I'll talk about one more. I finally saw also Knock on a Cabin. Knock at the Cabin? Yep. And you saw that movie, right, Zach? Uh, I have it, but I've heard... I've seen quite a bit about it, so I think I know most of the stuff about it, so... Okay, well, how much do you care for spoilers or? You, you can spoil I guess I'll try, it's fine, I'll, yeah. try, I'll, I'll try not to, but I mean, it's one of those things where, uh, before I ask, what I do you think the movie's about? Well, I, I, I mean, the it's there's the, the you know the family at the cabin, and then David Tyson is and his people like like it's, it's, it's like four of them show up, and they're like, oh, we're the I think they're, they're like we're the horsemen of the apocalypse, and we, and we, we, we you have to kill one. Of your, you have to sacrifice one of your like family members or, or, and to stop the apocalypse from happening. Okay. So the movie, the trailer does such a good job of that, that it kind of leaves, if that's what you think and you think, okay, maybe this will play around the idea that the tw it, because it's M. Night Shyamana, that there won't be a twist about it. Right? Mm -hmm. There isn't a twist. That's straight up the movie. Th that's the, that's what I heard. I heard I heard if you're going in and expecting like a crazy like M Night Shyamalan twist, it doesn't really have like a big a big twist. I mean, th there's like twists and turns, nope. but like not like a crazy like. And it, it was another planet the entire time, or like they're yeah. ghosts or whatever. I, like yeah. I was expecting that. So, the movie jumps around in 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 time and not timelines, but like flat they flash back a lot where it's between these two fathers and their daughter. And it's an alleg the movie definitely has a uh, allegory message about, you know, gay rights and gay marriage and and society accepting things. And they first think what's happening to them from these four horsemen is a like like a hate crime. And Dave Batista, it's really shocking because uh, he shows up. And he does his best to explain the overall plot to them. He goes, hey, like, he's really gentle. Like, he's way more, he's, like, very, uh, very detailed about his purpose. He's very, he's very apologetic when he shows up. He's like, hey, like, listen, this is going to be sound fucking crazy. Like, I, I apologize for my demeanor. I like, apologize for, like, what's going to happen next and all the things. Like, I... I wouldn't believe you either if this was happening. Like, he keeps explaining this a lot to the point where it is like a comedy. But the movie doesn't hold back on feeling brutal just for the fact that these four guys show up. They tell you you have to pick one person of the party you have to murder or else all of humanity is doomed. And if or it's like or you don't make a choice you'll be the only survivors for this whole thing and you'll be doomed to like live forever like to to see the world turn to nothing mm -hmm. 
and then they do their best of trying to convince this family to make this impossible decision. And yeah, uh, there's a little bit of like build a small B plot where you think it's all a setup. Uh, at least the the two main characters are thinking like, oh crap, like this is something that uh like may not seem what it is. But because of just how Dave Batista and his group presents the facts and stuff, it's like, listen, like you need to make a choice. You have two days to decide. And in two days, like it's gonna get shit store from here. And like you have a chance to save everyone. And it's like we've just been chosen. We've been giving a vision to do this. So it sounds like insane stuff that would happen. You know, if someone showed up and said you gotta do this, it's like what? However, uh, I, the big thing is that so every time they ask and they don't get a respond, they kill one of the members of the group. Mm-hmm. And so when that happens, like a plague happens, like a, something happens in the world, some sort of horrific incident. And so it, it goes from like an earthquake to um, a flu virus to out of control like fire to out of control thunder or like lightning that just starts hitting the world it, it's like a, almost like a doomsday um like na- natural act and stuff uh so yeah the movie just it makes you feel uncomfortable you know it's it there's no i mean at that point it's not funny anymore well <laughs> there is some dark humor to it but not in the way one there's like a gut punch at the end as a ha ha joke, but it, it's more to show that, uh, you know, this is just like how life is like life is random and chaotic. So I get the message. Uh, and it's definitely a movie I only need to see once, you know, it, it, it just it's super. It, it does a good job of like introducing the characters letting them know just enough that they're likable or unlikable. But in the end, like if you're still a human or a good person, you still feel bad about what's happening. And the fact that once you figure out that there isn't really a twist, it's just straight up, oh, a prophecy. Mm -hmm. Nothing really special. There's really nothing about the guys. They've just been chosen from Mystery Force to say you need to make a decision if humans are worthy or not. Like, can you sacrifice one for all? And, yeah, it's, uh... It's definitely, like... If you... I wouldn't be surprised if this was based on a short story or based on... It's it's based on a novel. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Okay, then, yeah, yeah. It it probably reads a lot better. Yeah, Yeah, the cabinet at the end of the world is the name of the novel. Gotcha. Yeah, I, again, I could see it. Like, it's it's a very good, um, just, like, tension-building element, you know? Like, you got, you got impossible sacrifice versus, like, an impossible, like, uh, thing that, like, you save this lot, you save the world, but no one would goddamn know. And, you know, like, it, it's not like he did this and he's gonna turn around and explain to people, like, I had to do it, you know? It's just, like, you're it, it's a lose lose no matter what but what is the bigger loss so uh i definitely recommend it i don't know if some movie you should watch with like people like <laughs> especially with a loved one because i feel like that's gonna have an awkward conversation autumn it's like a built-in argument you know it's it's a watch it so your your significant other and now have a goddamn fight right after so uh, yeah. It, it, again, see it for the drama. See it for Dave Batista's really calm. Yeah, I heard he's. I, I heard he's really good in it. He's very good in it, and he, they do play up the fact that he's just like a bodybuilder, like he's a giant man, and he's like, "Oh, I'm a I'm a preschool teacher." It's like, what preschool? <laughs> mm-hmm. And he's a preschool teacher, and then on his, like, part-time job, he's a bartender. And it's just like, I get the bartender. If you told me this guy worked at a bar, I would be like, yeah, of course. But mm-hmm. the whole gentleness to him and how he 
how he kind of consoles the the daughter character and then it, you see like he's actually like a good person it's just that he has to do this because he's been chosen himself and that this the sacrifice of what's going on like he can't escape it he's bound to be here you know he's just like holy shit like i i i don't blame you like you're not like i've made like i hope we could be friends after all of this you know like mm-hmm. he's that kind of guy and you get really like gut punch you know like ah, oh, oh. and then yeah the whole you you do hope that there is a twist just to justify something or just to just to see that you know there's a way out of this but there really wasn't and that's like even more scary uh so definitely recommend it uh probably just one time like me don't need to see it more than once <laughs> yeah just uh i'll talk about i talked about jolt and a knock knock at the cabin yeah knock at a cabin what about you zach what have you been watching so i saw a couple things uh I'm almost done with the first season of Prehistoric Planet on Apple TV Plus, which is the third in the BBC dinosaur documentary series. You know, the first one was Walking with Dinosaurs, you know, the huge 1999 Discovery Channel DVC show. And then they did Planet Dinosaur in 2011. And now we have Prehistoric Planet, uh, which first season came out last year. And then they had a new season this year. Um. Did, did you did you watch Walking with Dinosaurs, Chris? Yeah, no. Nah. I mean, when it was like Discovery Channel, that was like one of those huge like Discovery Channel like late '90s, early 2000s like shows. I just remember clips of it of just the CGI dinosaurs trying to explain their behavior, and then yeah, sort of. I mean, it's one of those. Um, I mean, it, the graphics have not aged well. I'll tell you that. No, I mean, I, well, I mean, I mean Prehistoric Planet is like the you know, obviously the, the latest. CG and also the latest like dinosaur scientific knowledge. So very very different t- take on what dinosaurs did and what they looked like compared to like walking with dinosaurs, which was you know twenty years ago, <laughs> over twenty years ago. Because mm-hmm. yeah, prehistoric planet like some of the, some of the stuff is wild on this one. Uh, like where they get into two dinosaurs that have almost have fur basically like it's like really like fur like feathers and just like like the behaviors they do and uh but it, it's it's all set during the cretaceous period so like, you know 65 million years ago and each episode is focused on a different kind of biome so it's desert or ice arctic environment or the coast and then you got you kind of see like all all the different creek dinosaurs that live in that area and how they survive and mate and hunt and all, all whatever else they're doing. And it's uh it's narrated and you know produced by uh Sir David Attenborough. So if you like Planet Earth, it's it has his his narration. It's very much Planet Earth but with dinosaurs. And yeah, just this cool fun. If you're into dinosaurs, like it's like a lot of uh, interesting. Uh, you see like a lot, a lot, a ver- lot of variety of dinosaurs, and, like lots of interesting behaviors and just storylines. There's a whole, there's a whole segment where there's like a, like a herd of triceratops like go underground into like this tunnel, and so it's like night vision. So you're like seeing like night vision triceratops like moving underground to like try to get to like this different area of like, uh, they're trying to find like clay to, to eat because they need like need it for like their uh, diets. And then, uh, like the first the first episode basically starts out with like T Rex like a T Rex and it's like you know juvenile T Rexes like swimming across this like seaway, like full on this like a T Rex swimming across the ocean basically to, like this this island to like so they can like uh, teach them how to hunt like sea turtles. And yeah, and the first episode is is very much like aquatic, so you get to see like mosasaurs and all these other like under like underwater dinosaurs and how they. Or underwater like reptiles and how they like survive and hunt and uh do what they're doing. A lot also also a lot of like pterosaurs. If you're into like you know different uh flying dinosaurs and flying reptiles, there's a lot of them in every episode. Because apparently because apparently they were all over the place in, in this uh era. 
it it'll, it'll, it's, it's also gonna destroy like any sort of like idea you have about velociraptors because this is like the actual like true scientific like velociraptors and they're like little tiny like turkey-sized chicken dinosaurs basically oh they're not giant like car no yeah animals. yeah dress, dress, dress Mark has lied to us for the entire Again? time yeah like Velociraptors, the Velociraptors of Jurassic Park are more like they're, they're actually they're not really Velociraptors. They're closer to like a, like a different type of dinosaur, like a Deinonychus. Like actual like actual Velociraptors were like little kind of like vulturey turkey, like more like a almost like more like copies, like more like like uh, the copies from Jurassic Park but with feathers. But yeah, they're 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 kind of all over the place in the, this era too, and they're like you can see like they team up and try to hunt down the little dinosaurs and avoid the bigger dinosaurs because they're nowhere near the top of the food chain. <laughs> Wait, did copies get eaten by other dinosaurs? Oh, I'm sure they did. Yeah, I'm just I'm just saying like like the velo- like actual Velociraptors seem like more like how the copies were in like Lost World, where they're like they're, yeah, they're, like, oh, okay. in, they're in packs, they're tiny. They're, you know, they're, they're not going to take, they're not taking down giant, they're like more like scavengers or like eating stuff that's smaller than them. I mean, it kind of makes sense because what, what, wait, 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 I thought velociraptors like were big. I thought they found bones that proved that they were at least bigger. They're, I mean, most scientists think that like all the skeletons they found, they, they're like average size of a velociraptor is like basically the size of like a turkey. So like, like, like maybe like like a foot like two a foot a foot tall two foot tall at the, at the, at the tallest. Yeah, what 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 like the ones that like if you're thinking like Jurassic Park, that's more of like a there's like a, a dinosaur called like a Deinonychus, and that there's like a, I think there's this whole like group of dinosaurs, but they're bigger. They have like the razor the razor sharp claws. They're like ma- human sized. Like that's that's what you think of. If you, that's 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 more of like what Jurassic Park turned the Velociraptor into. Gotcha. But it's a totally different dinosaur than... Huh. I see, like, as a kid, I just was okay about dinosaurs. I never got in on them to know about, like, the exact species. Yeah. Oh, I was, yeah, I was, like, obsessed with dinosaurs. <laughs> I had all the books. I was, like, learning about all the different species and everything. But then Trading every cards, 25 yeah. years, Every 25 years, new di- like, new discovery about dinosaurs that changes yep. everything. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Prehistoric Planet, really fun. If you, if you, if you have a TV Plus and if you like dinosaurs, if you like sort of like nature documentary stuff, it's definitely worth checking out. Very very good CG. Like, it's, you know, top of the line CG. I, I, John Favreau's a producer, I think, so I think it's his, like, um, like production company or production, like, I think, it's, I think the same studio that did Jungle Book did the, like, CG for this one. And it's, and like, Hans Zimmer does the score, so it's all, you know, Everything about it is like top tier, like best of the best kind of nature documentary stuff. So definitely we're checking out on Apple TV Plus. I'm going to try to finish. I want, I've seen the first four episodes of season one. There's one more left in season one. Then there's five episodes of season two. So got quite a few left, but definitely going to finish up all of them. And then over on Shudder, I watched, they have a documentary came out, I think last month. Uh, yeah, July 21st is when it came out, but uh, Shark Exploitation, which is a, it's a documentary all about uh, the shark movies uh, and the, the whole the whole shark exploitation genre that sprang up like post Jaws, where every after Jaws, like every movie was there's this, all this whole trend of like shark movies and killer shark movies. And it, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's it's fun. It's if you've seen other Shutter documentaries, like you know like the their their new. Uh, 100 scariest movie moments or any of their other original documentaries it's like a lot of the same people show up but also like a lot of like people who made shark movies like roger corman shows up and joe dante shows up and the guys from the asylum show up which is fun to, to talk about short sharknado and that, that that was one of the big revelations it's like oh the guys from the asylum like uh, they, they understand what they're they they know what they are they, they're not like they don't have any sort of delusions of grandeur about what they're doing they, they're like yeah we make shitty movies we make crappy movies but it's it's fun so i mean you gotta respect a company that knows what they are yeah 
that was that was I was like, oh, okay, they get it, they understand what they're doing. And they're not they're not just like you know like ah, we're gonna trick we're like we're like benevolently tricking people. And it's like yeah, we know we're, we're, we're copying movies, we're copying bigger movies. We're well, like we have no like budget. Canon, like Canon yeah. was like we make good movies on purpose. They're like I I don't know about that. But yeah, but they they hit so shark shark Foundation, they hit all the kind of big shark movies. They go through all the Jaws movies. Is that is that it's not like in depth Jaws. I'm sure there's other documentaries like like if you want deep dives into Jaws, like there's other documentaries for that. They they hit the big the major beats of Jaws, but then also get into like other like other big movies like the like the Shark Attack series and Deep Blue Sea and the uh, Open Water and all and like recent ones. They they they. Did, they, end, they kind of end it with like touching on like all these like insane like super ultra low budget movies that are like it's not even like a CG shark it's like a cartoon drawing of a shark like all the, all the ones all the ones that are like a like all the ones on Tubi that like regular media t- talks about like Ghost Shark or Ouija Shark or all those all those like Amityville Shark like all those movies they talk about toward the end because that's like the new that's that's the new like trend that's is happening is like these like ultra 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 low budget like barely, Schlock. barely, barely, not even a million dollars. Shark movies, schlock that's coming out. Wait, wait, wait. So they don't even feature like a CG shark. It's like a super cartoony shark in those movies. <laughs> it depends on the movie, but like they should. If you if you watch clips of some of those movies, like yeah, some of them are like it's a puppet, like a hand puppet, or it's like a cr- very very crappy animation of a shark, or like it looks like a, a child's drawing of a shark it's like it's not not all of them are like even cg like even the like crappy cg it's like even sub crappy cg it's like so, some of them are just like we had ten dollars to make this movie <laughs> and i filled it in my house with like a, like an iphone like you know what's insane i feel like sharks are one of the first creature features like made right like what i mean they're not the first first but one of the things that define a blockbuster yeah. So if you want to make Jaws, a good Jaws, Jaws definitely, yeah. Right. So if you want to make a good shark movie, you need to aim kind of high because people like sharks are real. You know, like you could even use just stock footage if you need to for sharks. So yeah. the fact well, that a lot of, yeah, a lot, a lot of the, a lot of the like a lot of the movies around the era of Jaws did that. Like they had like stock footage or they had people dive into the water and swim into the actual sharks. And actually, that, that's one of the interesting two things too is like they they get into some of the movies like pre Jaws that didn't necessarily they had sharks in them but they weren't necessarily like shark movies but that's kind of like more some of the origins of like you know shark sharks in movies there's like other there's like adventure movies or like ocean ocean thrillers that had like oh this the boat got attacked by a shark but it's not the entire movie isn't about a shark but this one scene had a shark in it but that's kind of like where that's like the origins of like getting to, to getting to building towards jaws and then they also and also like other movies are they're like kind of it sharks station like they're kind of in that genre but even if they're not about sharks so you have like you know alligator and grizzly and uh piranha they're all also in shark exploitation because it's they're like they're like taking it they're taking off on jaws Yeah, there's a whole there's a whole actually Wikipedia has a whole list of like shark exploitation movies, <laughs> like going from like start, starting with Jaws and then go, like going from there and like ending up in like you know 2000 this year with like Meg, the, the trench and the reef and well at least the I give, I give down. the Meg some difference because instead of being a regular size shark, it's like a giant giant shark. So that yeah. I give it like I give it a pass for the rest of them that are just a killer shark that is normal size. That's where, you know, you could see the, my disdain, like, wait, they cut corners on the, the, the creature here? Yeah. Well, the interesting t- thing, too, is, like, you kind of have two kind of branches, cur- like, in, like the mo- in, in the modern day shark exploitation genre, you have kind of two branches where it's, like, there's shitty, 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 ultra low budget, to be, like, Ouija shark movies, and then you have, like... The Hollywood actually theatrical releases you have you know like 47 meters down and uh the shallows and open water and uh they're like actually like 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 tre- like actual sharks like no fantastical craziness it's just like a kind of throw a, more like what Jaws is doing like a, a survival 
th- movie with with sharks. But then you also have like then you have like five headed shark attack or like Ozark sharks or ghost sharks. So it's like two it's two like it's the, the same like overall genre, but then two crazy different split split paths of like you can either go this way and be, a, be have a realistic shark movie or this way and a crazy what you have to come up with like the craziest possible shark thing you could possibly think of. Sharknado or whatever. So demon sharks, robot sharks, whatever. Gotcha. So it's yeah, it's it's fun. The, the documentary is fun if you if you enjoy like the other like Shutter documentaries, or just, or just want to watch get get like kind of like an overview of like this whole crazy shark genre. genre. Uh, definitely check that out on uh, Shutter. And then I think another for me this week, so we can wrap things up. Uh, head over to site. We got all sorts of our. Uh, features up there. We got our trailers we talked about. We got news, reviews, features. We've got our commentary from last month, which was uh, the Rocketeer. And we're going to be doing, I believe, we're doing Star Wars: The Clone Wars this month. So come back next week for that. Just time for Ahsoka. And all the other, uh, all of our features and news, reviews, and other things up on the site as well. Head over check all stuff out. And uh, yeah, so for Chris, I'm Zach, and we will see you next week for more everything action head to www.everythingaction.com. You can also follow us on Twitter, at EVAction, on Facebook by searching for Everything Action, and follow us on Instagram at everything.action. You can also subscribe and get more episodes on Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify.